Okay, so for this uh, uh, next presentation, this is going to be very, I know a lot of people are interested in water technologies and water science in general, and you're going to find this presentation really, really interesting. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have uh, met our next presenter uh, a few years back at Tesla Tech. Karen Elkins, who is down there, um, uh, introduced us, and it's always been in, kind of in the back of my mind, and luckily that uh, his schedule uh, worked out where he's going to be able to uh, um, share this presentation with you. Um, Victor uh, Sagalovsky is, that, is uh, the co-founder of Light, uh, Light Water Scientific, the first and only super uh, deuterium-depleted uh, light water in the world, where he has dedicated himself to the field of deuterium depletion. Victor has researched the uh, benefits of deuterium-depleted water through his uh, theory entitled Endogenous Radiation Damage Theory of Aging. Uh, it proposes that our biggest obstacle to longevity is the excess deuterium and other da damaging isotopes on the planet, and proper mitigation will radically extend our uh, lifespans. He attended Loyola University and the University of Hawaii when he uh, pursued multidisciplinary uh, education. He's completed uh, apprenticeships and graduate coursework in chemistry, optical microscopy, and molecular biology. Uh, he's the author of many articles and guides in the field of wellness, biohacking, emerging and alternative medicine, technology, mysticism, and esoteric wisdom. Outside of the water category, Victor is the author of Gold, Catalyst of Radiant Health, a book about the history and science of the medicinal benefits of gold, and is uh, adept in gold alchemy and the making of orms. Please welcome uh, Victor. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for inviting me and having me at this conference. So we're going to talk about deuterium, and we're going to talk about human biology and how energy is made. This is an energy conference, and this presentation touches on the energy that we need, humans. So I want you to buckle up, because we're going to go on a really fun ride. And by the end, you guys will all be experts in this field, I hope. Uh, how many, raise your hands if you ever heard the word deuterium or know what deuterium is. Okay, so this is a receptive crowd, because usually there's like one hand in the back, maybe I heard about it. <laughs> so this is great. As we can see here in the beginning, you had the proton, deuterium. It was supposed to become helium, but it got stuck in the middle because the universe cooled too quickly. And we pretty much still have the same amount of deuterium as we had all those billions of years ago. So how does this translate to us? Well, like all hydrogen, it will bind with oxygen to create water. So we have a few different types of water on the planet when you consider all the different isotopes. If you take in the isotopes of oxygen, include those, you have over 60 configurations of the water molecule. What we know is water is H2O. However, there's also HDO, HDO, and D2O. Now D2O we don't talk about much because this is something that you have to make in a lab and only one out of every 41 million hydrogen uh, one out of every 41 million hydrogen isotopes is, uh, is the D2O variety. So that's something that we make in the lab for uh, uh, atomic purposes, nuclear, for nuclear power stations and uh, early atomic weapons and whatnot. But this one, this is the one that occurs one in 3,300 water molecules. So for every, every 3,300 water molecules that are H2O, you get one that's HDO, the D standing for deuterium. This is distributed, as you can see, uh, even a better illustration of how you have the oxy oxygen isotopes, the hydrogen isotopes, but what we want to get from this slide is that all water on Earth and, and the known universe contains deuterium. All living things of every species, plant and animal contain deuterium. That means all foods, everything that we have in our atmosphere, everything that we consume, everything that consumes us has deuterium. The deal that was made, the deal that was struck also long ago, 1.45 billion years ago, in fact, they made a long-term contract between mitochondria and a primitive eukaryotic cell. The eukaryotic cell said, listen, I need water on this planet. Mitochondria said, that's my specialty. I produce water. Okay, I produce H2O from shuttling protons and electrons, combusting them and creating water. They said, great, let's make a deal. You produce the water that I need, and I'll provide you housing and protection. The deal was going so well that not too long after that, the eukaryotic cell said, how about you're doing such a great job making water, 
why don't you also take over the energy requirements that the cell needs? And the mitochondria said, I'll do it. We'll sign a long-term contract, which they did, and it's still in force today. But the deal was that the cell would provide housing and protection and, like I said, food. Mitochondria needs an enormous amount of food. And that was the deal. The mitochondria said, I'll provide energy and water, and you provide shelter and food. Every human from birth to death is comprised, compromised, compromised in their mitochondrial energy production by the ubiquitous presence of deuterium. And we're going to drill down a little bit further into this. So the mitochondria is doing everything it can to keep deuterium away from the electron transport chain because there is something that's happening that's purely a mechanical problem. And I'll explain what that is. But first, we're going to look at how deuterium is uh, represented as in water throughout the, our planet. So unfortunately, only two and a half to two and three quarter percent of the Earth's water is fresh water. Out of that is frozen in glaciers, 78 percent is frozen in glaciers. One percent of that is available to all living things. So 99.9 .9 percent of humans consume water that is in a range of 140 to 155 parts per million of deuterium. So there's not much fresh water on this planet even less that we consume, and even less that has lower deuterium than the mean or the average. Mostly, if people live in very uh, uh, mountainous areas or away from the hydrological cycle of the oceans, they may have slightly lower deuterium. And this is important because this is how this discovery comes to us in the first place. So, around the 1950s, there was this, this discovery comes from Siberia, when they first started looking at this. They wanted to know why there were specifically two populations in Siberia, the Akutians and the Altaians, these people right here. And they, were, they pretty much live like Eskimos. It's six plus months out of the year, it's like minus 50 degrees or worse where they live. And they were trying to figure out why these people had so much more, uh, not only healthy people, but centenarians. So they had 324 centenarians per one million, which was six times more than the national average. And in fact, anywhere in Europe for that matter. Uh, they were drinking glacial melt, okay, uh, in the spring. And so they, they wanted to see what the deuterium level of this water is. Sure enough, it was 16% lower than everywhere else. So they said, oh, these people, maybe they're living longer and healthier because they have 16% less deuterium in their water. Uh, they ran out of funds, actually, to keep drilling, so they tested just the runoff water and even the snow water there, and it was exactly the same. It was 16% lower in deuterium than the mean average, which is 150 in most, in most cities. Back to collagen, uh, it has this chiral nature, it has this spiral nature, and so when you look at some uh, study that I found uh, out of China that showed that when they were topically, topically uh, um, putting water on, basically in somebody's face, or not, not somebody's face, this probably was done with uh, uh, some skin that was probably in a little test tube or something or, or a petri dish. But they found this collagen layer uh, to grow twice the size of what uh, a regular collagen layer would look like if you were, if you were uh, topically introducing regular tap water, 150 ppm. So you could see the increase in collagen growth when you reduce the amount of deuterium. It's only because of energy. You, you open up an enormous amount of energy possibility when you reduce the deuterium. When you reduce deuterium, you get a true net energy benefit, which you really don't get through food or any other, by any other means. So we had this event that happened, and it's called the flood. It's a myth in the Bible. It's in, it's in other old books <laughs> that uh, we have on record. And uh, something interesting happened uh, with this flood. We don't know what it is. But we do know that if you look at the patriarchs, and you believe that the first patriarchs lived 900 years, Seth, Adam, Enos, all these patriarchs were living into the above 500 years. They're living above 800, 900 years of life. If you believe that, let's just say we do believe that. Okay? And then, but after the flood, you have all the patriarchs all the way to the last one, Abraham there. Uh, their lifespans 
changed. They, they uh, decreased. Same thing, if you look at the pre-flood beaver, look at the size of that thing. And you look at the average beaver today. Before the flood, animals were bigger. Plants were bigger. What was this flood? We don't know. But what we do know is it introduced an enormous amount of deuterium that slowed everything down and made everything smaller. Because the body is, is meta mostly metabolic water, when you take a test of saliva, that's more indicative of the water that's in interstitial, interstitial water. And when you test the breath vapor, if you could test breath vapor, just collecting it, you have, if you collect five, mill five milliliters of breath vapor, we'll be able to test it. And then you could see the delta between the metabolic water and the other bulk water in your body. And if you see that there is a delta, you'll know, especially, well, if that delta is, if, if, you have, if your metabolic water is a couple points lower than your bulk water in your body, you know that your body is doing something to filter out deuterium. You know that it's actively working. But if you don't see any delta at all between metabolic water and bulk water in your body, then you know you're rapidly aging because you're not able to, you're not, you're, you're, Metabolism isn't even able to filter a little bit of deuterium out of your body. This is why I believe that deuterium depletion, or this knowledge of this problem of deuterium in our biology, is the greatest discovery of, in biology of our time. And it's just, we're just going to see where this lands in the next decade or two, because it's taken such a long road from the 30s of the discovery of deuterium to the 50s of discovery that, that there's a difference between heavy water and light water, and then 2007, the discovery that how it damages the mitochondria to, to 2018 when we started making this water first available to the North American market. Well, deuterium gets, gets locked up in tissue or it gets locked up everywhere in our bodies. It's attached everywhere, again, everywhere where there's a hydrogen has a potential to be a deuterium instead. So the way our, our body filters it out using the process of deuterium depletion, deuter drinking deuterium depleted water, is through the mechanism of hydrogen exchange. It gets traded out. And the same thing happens when you're fasting. So fasting is a, is a way to reduce deuterium. It just, it's, just a, it's, just, it's just you're going to get it back <laughs> once you start eating and drinking. So, so deuterium depletion really becomes the only net energy strategy that we have, net, that, that net increase of net energy. Because everything else will ultimately be a uh, will ultimately take energy from the system. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor.